So, Jana and I moved to Arizona almost 10 years ago. We were pregnant when we moved. Uh, Jana had Knox uh, back in 2010. And uh, a little while after that, it was a Sunday afternoon. So imagine for a moment, um, we had just gone to church. We had come home with our baby. Uh, We had eaten lunch and put Knox down for his afternoon nap. And Jana and I were kind of getting ready for what the rest of the day had for us. I, I want to say that we had plans that evening, uh, but I can't remember. Uh, and so we're kind of just uh, picking up the house a little bit, cleaning up from lunch. And we were doing dishes, and Jana was washing and I was drying. And so uh, we're, we're, we're going through the process, and we're chit-chatting as we're going and just talking about our day and the week that's coming up. Uh, and Jana had washed our glasses, our, our drinking cups, and had placed them in. I rinsed them off. And, and I was taught as a kid, when you had a, a glass that you were drying, that you take the towel and you wad it up and kind of stuff it in. Yeah, hey, do you guys do that? Where you stuff it in? Because you got to dry the bottom of the glass, not just the outside. That's what I was taught. And so I, I take this towel and I kind of twist it into the cup and I'm, I'm drying the inside. I'm twisting the towel inside this cup. And then I always had this habit and I think it's my OCD, where I would take the edge of the towel that was sticking out of the cup and I would grasp it and I would wipe the rim of the glass. Guys, that's where your lips touch the glass. So I always made sure that that was super, super clean. So I've got this towel in the glass and I, I clamp down on the, on the rim of the glass and I start twisting and turning to, to wipe that rim. And, and in the process, the glass shattered in my hand. I'm not going to go into the gory details, but the piece of glass that my thumb and finger were grasping because I was pushing at that moment went into my wrist. And in that moment, I looked down and I went, "Uh uh-oh. And Jana has a medical background, so she was the one that sprung into action. She was like, here's a towel. Boom, put it on the wrist. Lay down. She started telling me what all to do. And, And so I'm laying down. I got my hand up and quickly our white kitchen towel turned completely red. And Jana went, okay. It sprung into the next level of action. I got to go get the baby. While I'm getting the baby, don't do anything. Lay there. Keep pressure on it. So she goes and gets Knox. Knox is furious because we've woken him from his afternoon nap. And she puts him in the car seat. She comes over to where I'm at. She's got Knox in the, in the car seat. She goes, okay, get up, we got to get to the car. And so she helps me up and I'm I'm making my way to the car and I'm holding pressure on my wrist and and we get in the car and we drive to the urgent care and we swing into the parking lot and the parking lot is completely full. There's not a single parking space in the parking lot. Jana goes, okay, I'm going to stop here, get out, I'll find a parking space, you go in and get checked in. Okay, that sounds good. And so I get out, I stammer my way to the door. I'm looking as white as my shirt is right now. Um, and so I walk over to the, the front desk and the receptionist looks up at me and she goes, uh, yeah, how can I help you? And I'm holding this towel and I look up and I said, I think I need to see a doctor. And she says, okay, uh, what for? And I said, I slipped my wrist. First lesson. Don't tell a medical professional you slit your wrist. They go to the worst assumptions about what happened. Luckily, and I praise Jesus for this on a regular basis, at that exact moment, Jana had found a space, grabbed Knox, walked into the door, and I think she heard me say, I slipped my wrist. And Jana goes, whoa, that is not what happened. He got stabbed in the wrist by broken glass. And the receptionist was like, oh, thank goodness. Because that if he slid his wrist, that's a whole other set of processes that we have to go through. So I, I get checked in and I go and lay down. Long story short, they, they took me back. They stitched me all up. I was fine. I was a little woozy for a couple of days while my body put blood back into my system. But I, 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 I recovered completely. It was, it was fine. But there's a lesson to learn here. I don't tell a sto- funny story just to tell a funny story, although it's a funny story. Uh, but what's the point here? I learned in that moment that as a husband, I have no business doing dishes. Amen. Husbands, you can lean over, you can nudge your wife. That's scriptural. The preacher said it from stage, honey. No dishes for me ever again. You don't want me in sin, sweetheart. 
No, I still help Jana with the dishes all the time, although I do not dry glasses in that manner anymore. But um, what is the lesson to this? Uh, I am normally pretty good at making decisions, even on the fly decisions. And I'm a pretty good communicator. Well, I think I'm a good communicator. I don't know what you guys think, but I think I'm a good communicator most of the time. But in that moment, because of my weakness, I was not a good decision maker, nor was I a good communicator in that moment. I almost got myself in much more trouble because I wasn't thinking about what I was communicating. I made bad decisions in my weaknesses. And so today, we're going to look at one of the weakest men in the Bible. One, of the, one man that is known for his weakness, Samson. And you go, whoa, wait, wait, wait. Samson's not known for his weakness. Samson is known for his strength. Uh, hold on. Samson is known for his physical strength. He is well known as well for his spiritual weakness. So take your Bibles or your apps or whatever you read on, and I want you to turn to Judges chapter 14. Judges chapter 14. Now, if you don't have a Bible with you, there are Bibles in the chairs around you. Grab one of those. Judges is the seventh book in the Bible. So you'll go through Genesis, Exodus, uh, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, then you'll go to Joshua, and then you'll get to Judges. If you get to a book that has a one or a two in front of it, you've gone too far. You need to back back up. So, Judges chapter 14. Now, as you're turning there, let me give you a recap of where we've been in the biblical timeline up to this point. We've gone through Genesis, which is Adam and Eve, Noah, Abraham, Abraham's son Isaac, Isaac's son Jacob, Jacob's son Joseph. We've gone through all of that. And then from Joseph, we jump into the book of Exodus where we talked about Moses. Um, and that gets us through uh, Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. And then we jumped over, we kind of jumped over Joshua, the book of Joshua. Uh, I touched on it, but I didn't preach heavily on it. And now we're in Judges. We started Judges last week with a man named Gideon. And now we're towards the end of the book of Judges with a man named Samson. Now Samson was what's called a Nazarite. If you read chapter 13 in the book of Judges, you're going to read about that he was dedicated by God, he was commanded by God to his parents to be a Nazarite. A Nazarite, you have to go back to Numbers, the book of Numbers, chapter 6. And in Numbers chapter 6, it says, if you're taking a serious, hardcore God-related vow, maybe you should take a Nazarite vow. And a Nazarite vow was basically, you could do a lifelong vow or you could do a temporary vow. For example, Paul. At one point in Paul's ministry, Paul takes a temporary Nazarite vow. And what the Nazarite vow was, was it was a vow that you took and then you took steps on top of it to show the seriousness of the vow. So for example, a razor could not touch your head. So when Paul takes his Nazarite vow, what does he do? He shaves his head completely and then does not let a razor touch his head from that point forward to show that he's in the vow. Because guys, back then, people didn't shave their heads among the Israelites. I would stand, up, stand out like a sore thumb because I'm bald. Did you? Okay. So... If you saw somebody bald or with very, very short hair, you knew that they were taking a Nazarite vow. And so you'd shave your head and then not let a razor touch your head. If you were a lifelong Nazarite, like Samson or like John the Baptist, you never shaved your head, ever, ever. You just let your hair grow and grow and grow. Uh, and you could clip it, but you couldn't shave it down. So you couldn't do that. You couldn't eat grapes or drink anything that came from a grape. So you couldn't drink grape juice or wine. I know some of you in this room are going, oh man, I could never be a Nazarite. It's okay. Then the last thing that the Nazarite vow required is that you never, ever, ever touch a dead body. So you couldn't touch a dead animal or a dead body that had passed away. It even goes in number six as extreme to say, even if your mother or father pass away, you have to avoid touching the dead body. You have to bring somebody in to make the burial arrangements until your Nazarite vow is completed. 
So it's kind of this very stringent, strict, rule-abiding vow. Samson is a lifelong Nazarite. So he can't shave his head, he can't touch anything dead, and he can't eat or drink anything from a grape. Now, if you read Samson's story, he does all those things. He, he touches dead bodies. He, he reaches in the dead carcass of a lion at one point in his, his life to get something out of it. Um, at one point, uh, he throws a big party. And the Hebrew word there for party is, literally means a big drinking party. It, there were distinctions in parties that the Hebrews had. And the word, the type of party that Samson threw was a drinking party, which means he probably drank. He constantly broke the rules. And not only that, he constantly broke the rules in relationships. And that's what our focus is going to be today, is how he constantly disobeyed God's instructions and boundaries for what a good, godly, healthy relationship looks like. Now, let me just say this. We're talking about relationships, but I'm not just talking about romantic or dating or married relationships. I'm also talking about close personal friendships. The things that we're going to talk about today apply to close, intimate, personal relationships, friendships as well. So, Here's my statement for today. I have one statement. If you're a note taker, this is something you want to write down. And also, if you're a note taker, by the way, I've got a lot of Bible verses that I'm reading today. So get your pen ready because there's going to be a lot. The statement today is this. God has purpose for relationships, so seek relationships purposefully. God has a purpose for every single one of your relationships whether it be romantic, husband-wife, friendship, co-workers, kids, grandkids, parents, whatever. Every connection with another human being that you have is, has some kind of purpose for God. God has a purpose. And so we should probably approach relationships with purpose, with a point. And so today I'm going to give you four ideas that help us have that purpose, that purposeful intent in our relationship. So the four, four things, the first one is this, have wisdom. If we're going to seek to have purpose in our relationships, we need to have wisdom in those relationships. So take your Bibles, turn with me to Judges 14, and we're going to start in verse 1. I'm going to give you an example of how Samson showed us the opposite of what we're supposed to do when it comes to wisdom and relationships. So chapter 14, verse 1, it says this. Samson went down to Timnah. Now, side note. Timnah was not an Israelite city. Timnah was a city of a foreign people, the Philistines. Now, the Philistines are in control of the Israelite land at this point in time. And the Philistines gave the Israelites lots of freedom to go and do what they wanted. They weren't oppressive necessarily, but they also weren't God followers. They worshipped idols. And so Samson is going to a foreign city, but look at what happens in this foreign city. Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Then he came up and told his father and mother, I saw one of the daughters of the Philistines at Timnah. Now go and get her for me as my wife. But his father and mother said to him, Is there not a woman among the daughters of your relatives or among your people that you must go and take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? But Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she is right in my eyes. We need to have wisdom. First off, we need to have wisdom to listen to the godly advice that's around us. When it comes to friendships or dating uh, or, or family relationships or work relationships, whatever that may be, we need to listen to godly advice and God's word on how to interact with all the different people that we come across day in and day out, that we have relationship with. We need to understand that lust is not love. 
There's a distinct difference. And I'm not talking just about romantic lust. I'm talking about even that lust of people that we look at and we go, oh man, I want to be that person's friend because they're into the hobby that I'm into. Or or they have the lifestyle that I long to have. Or you know, they have this status and I want to have a status like that. So I want to seek them out as my friend so that I can fit in with that same status group. We lust after the things that people have around us. We want what they have. And sometimes we seek friendships with other people because of the lust for what they have rather than what we should be seeking, which is godly wisdom. So please understand that when you look at your relationships, you may need to look at why you have that relationship. Is it because God commands you or has a purpose in that relationship that you are intently and, and, and seeking after intentionally? Or are you pursuing that relationship because they have something you want? Status uh, or hobby or, or lifestyle or whatever it may be. In Samson's case, it was all about what he saw. She is right to me in my eyes. All he cared about was looks. He didn't care the fact that she worshiped idols and that she could turn him away from his God all he cared about is what he saw that's what he wanted lastly when it says when I say have wisdom don't listen to your heart what what's the the common cultural advice that we get follow your heart don't follow your heart it's the worst advice that you could get it literally is anti-biblical it is opposite of what God's word says so turn to or Jeremiah 17, verse 9. Don't turn there because I want you to stay in Judges, unless you can do that. Jeremiah 17, verse 9 says this. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The heart is the worst and last place that we should go for advice. Listening and following our hearts is what leads us to lust and sin. Because what does your heart want? It wants whatever you're tempted with. That's what your heart desires. That's why the Bible over and over, Psalm 37, 4 says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, we've got to focus our every ounce of being on God if we're going to follow our heart because our heart is going to follow exactly what God does not want for us because it's deceitful and wicked. And so we have to not listen to our heart. So, you're dealing with a relationship issue, your first instinct is probably your heart. Oh, man, she looks so fill in the blank. No, that's your heart speaking. God wants you to say, that woman is so godly. That woman is such an amazing woman of God. Rather than leading with our heart, we lead with God's word. So don't listen to your heart. Have wisdom. The second thing, so have wisdom. The next one is have standards. Have standards. I tell teenagers this all the time. I used to, used to be a youth pastor. And I would tell teenagers and teach teenagers all the time, have standards for who you're going to date. Don't just date the first guy or girl that comes along. Have standards. Say, I won't date someone unless they have these qualifications. The first of which should be that they are a follower of Jesus Christ. And so, what does Samson do? Open your Bibles again to Judges 14. We've already read verse 1, but we're going to read it again. So, chapter 14, verse 1 says, And Samson went down to Timnah, and at Timnah he saw one of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, fast forward to chapter 16, verse 1. Chapter 16, verse 1. Samson went to Gaza, which again was in the land of the Philistines, not in the land of Israel. Samson went to Gaza, and there he saw a prostitute and went into her. Okay? Now, fast forward to uh, chapter 16, verse 4. So, just a few verses down. After this, he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The valley of Sorek was the dividing line between the land of the Philistines and the land of the Israelites, but it belonged to the Philistines. It was the boundary line, but was leaned into, was owned by the Philistine people. So a lady, a woman from the Valley of Sorek, was a Philistine woman. Where do we see Samson going over and over and over again? He goes to people who don't love God. 
He seeks relationships with people who don't love God. And what does it do? It gets him in trouble time and time again. Ultimately, it's going to end his life. We're going to see in just a, a few minutes. So, have wisdom, have standards. What does the rest of the Bible say about having standards? Well, 1 Corinthians 15.33 1 Corinthians 15.33 says, Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Whoa. Bad company ruins good morals. The idea being that if we want to live a godly lifestyle, we don't need to have really strong friendships, intimate friendships with people who do not follow God or do not live a godly lifestyle. Because those people are going to ultimately ruin our good morals or our pursuit of those good morals. So the idea here is that we need to have standards. I am not saying, please hear me, please hear me on this. I am not saying don't have friends who aren't Christians. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying you can have friends with people of all faiths, but your closest, most intimate friendships need to be with Jesus' followers. Because when you're going through a difficult time and your closest friends are giving you advice, do you want worldly advice or do you want godly advice? You want godly advice. You need godly advice. Here's another passage that tells us the same thing, but a little stronger. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 says... Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? I use this passage all the time as a youth minister to say don't date unchristians. Don't date someone who's not a follower of Jesus. Don't be unequally yoked. But this doesn't specifically say being married to. It's, being, it's using the illustration of any close tied relationship. The idea being that our closest relationships should be with fellow believers. Build friendships with those who don't know Jesus. That's how we minister. That's how we witness. That's how we share the gospel. But your closest friendships should be with Jesus' followers. I have friends. Surprise, surprise, the pastor has friends. I do have friends. I won't tell you how many. Few or lots, that doesn't matter. But my two closest friends outside of my wife in the whole world are ministers of the gospel. One of them was a minister and he, he is now working in a hospital. But he is a devout follower of Jesus Christ. And when I'm struggling or I need a shoulder to cry on and my wife is not available or I need a shoulder to cry on because my wife is hurting and I can't go to my wife, or, or I have a complaint, or I have an issue, and I need to speak with a guy friend, I go to him. I go to one of those two guys, because they're going to give me godly advice. They're not going to direct me to turn my faith away from God, or do something that God does not want me to do. They're going to direct me to increase my faith, and find my faith in God's Word. That's why your closest relationships need to be with Jesus' followers. So, I've talked about having wisdom. I've talked about having standards. The third piece of advice is have boundaries. Have boundaries. Let's read the good part of Samson's story, the, 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 the scandalous part. So, chapter 16, starting in verse 6. Chapter 16, starting in verse 6. So, Delilah said to Samson, Please, Tell me where your greatest strength lies and how you might be bound that one can subdue you. And Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven fresh bowstrings that had not been dried, and she bound him with them. What? Now she had men lying in ambush in an inner chamber, and she said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. But he snapped the bowstrings as thread of flax snaps when it touches the fire. So the secret of his strength was not known. So Samson reveals what she thinks is the way to take his strength away. And what does she do? She does the very thing that he tells her will take his strength away. So what happens next? Verse 10. Then Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you've mocked me. 
You told me lies. Please tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If they bind me with new ropes that have not been used, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. What do you think is about to happen? So Delilah took new ropes and bound him with them and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And the men lying in ambush were in an inner chamber, but he snapped the ropes off his arms like a thread. What happens next? You can probably guess at this point. Verse 13, Then Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me how you might be bound. And he said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my hair with the web and fasten it tight with the pin, then I shall become weak and be like any other man. What do you think is about to happen? Yep, you guessed it. So, while he slept, Delilah took his seven locks on his head and wove them into a web and made them tight. And with a pin, she pinned it and said to him, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. And he awoke from his sleep and pulled away the pin, the loom, and the web. What do you think is about to happen? You guessed it. Verse 15. And she said to him, How can you say I love you when your heart is not with me? You've mocked me these three times and you have not told me where your great strength lies. Mind you, he has lied to her three times and she has done exactly what he told her to do to take away his strength. But look at what it says in verse 14. Or, sorry, verse 16. And when she pressed him hard with her words day after day and urged him, his soul was vexed to death. Oh my gosh, she's not going to stop, is what Samson is saying here. Verse 17, and he told her all his heart and said to her, a razor has never come upon my head, for I've been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. So if my head is shaved, then my strength will leave me and I shall become weak and be like any other man. What do you think happens? Yep, you guessed it. Verse 18, when Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called to the lords of the Philistines saying, come up again, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hands. They paid her for these lies, for her turning him in. She made him sleep on her knees and she called a man and had him shave off the seven locks of his head. And then she began to torment. Then she began to torment him and his strength left him. And basically, long story short, he gets captured because God's strength is not in him any longer. Have boundaries. How many red flags did God send to Samson in this situation? Glaring like neon flashing signs type of red flags, right? Warning, Samson! Warning! She is going to do exactly what you don't need her to do. She is going to do the one thing that is going to end your life. Warning, Samson! And what does Samson do? Rather than paying attention to the red flags and establishing health healthy boundaries, he stayed with her and fell right into the trap. It is okay to have good, godly boundaries in your relationships. Proverbs 22, verses 24 and 25. Proverbs 19, verse 19. Confirm this. Titus 3. So think about Titus. Titus is a New Testament book written by Paul to a man named Titus who's a preacher and he's writing to Titus to tell him and instruct him how to be a good preacher of a church. And listen to the advice that Paul gives to Titus in chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, mind you, this is among people who claim to be Jesus followers. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and self-condemned. Guys, I know that this is hard to hear, but sometimes, especially with brothers and sisters in Christ who are drawing you away from God's purpose and drawing you away from the, the plan and purpose that God has for you, when that is taking place and they're doing so sinfully, Titus 3 says to stop hanging around them at all. Disassociate. I know this is hard to hear, but this is what a healthy boundary looks like. When somebody is destroying your faith or urging you to walk away from your faith or is 
manipulating you in a way that damages your faith, get out of that relationship. Period. End of story. 1 Corinthians 5 confirms this. Verse 11. But now I am writing you to not associate with anyone who bears the name of brother. In other words, anyone who claims to be a Christian. Do not associate with him if he is guilty of sexual immorality or greed or idolatry or is a reveler, drunkard, or swindler. Do not even eat with such a one. Guys, this is a hard message to hear. I know that. But God has designed us to be, first off, in relationship, but in relationships with healthy biblical boundaries. And when we start seeing the red flags like Samson saw, we need to reevaluate our relationships, especially our close ones, especially our close ones to fellow Christians. We have to have healthy boundaries. So, have wisdom, have standards, have boundaries, and lastly, have humility. Have humility. Guys, none of us in this room will have a perfect relationship, will we? You, husbands, you can look at your wife and say, oh, honey, that doesn't apply to us. We have a perfect relationship. I know that you're lying. It's okay. Maybe you need to lie in that relationship to, to keep her happy. That's okay. What I'm telling you is you cannot be a perfect friend. You cannot be a perfect husband or wife. You can't be a perfect employee or employer. You can't be a perfect son or daughter or father or mother. It is not possible because we're sinners in need of a Savior. And guys, the good news is, is that Jesus died on a cross just for that purpose. Jesus died on a cross because we need that redemption. We need that salvation because we can't be perfect. And so the fact of the matter is, is Jesus died on a cross to forgive us of our sins so that our relationship could be reconciled with God the Father. And guys, let me make a push here. If Jesus died on a cross to reconcile our relationship with our Father, then probably we need to be reconciling our relationships with others. Don't you think? If that was the point of Jesus' death on the cross, to save us of our sins, to forgive us, and to reconcile us to the Father, which is what the New Testament says distinctly in that exact verbiage, then maybe God's calling us to reconcile and redeem our relationships as well. But that's going to take humility. That's going to be us saying, you know what? Call that person up. I messed up. I'm sorry. But I know that God is leading me to reconcile and do what I can to repair this relationship. God wants to redeem. He wants to reconcile. But will you be humble enough to say, you know what? I messed it up. I need your forgiveness. Some of you may need to make a phone call after church today. Some of you may need to sit down and have a hard conversation with the Lord and say, God, I need the strength to say I'm sorry. God calls us to fix our relationships for this purpose, for His glory. To lead people, people closer to Jesus Christ. So my question this morning is this. What standards and boundaries do you need to live in? And who do you need to seek redemption and rec reconciliation with today? Who's that person you need to call? Will you join me in prayer?